People often fantasize about immortality. But what if a person could live for a few hundred years, or thousands? What would an immortal look like? What would they do? How would they relate to family and religion? In 2007, director Richard Shankman attempted to explore these questions in the science fiction film The Man from Earth, and this fiction makes us contemplate the real. That's the case with John. There's a grave disorder. Is he serious? If he is. The film begins with scenes of a 35-year-old man loading his belongings into the open bed of a pickup truck. Two cars approach his house. People step out of them. Dan, Sandy, Harry, and Edith. They are colleagues and friends of the main character, Professor John Oldman. They are puzzled, why is he planning to leave and without saying goodbye? Dan jokes that he must be in a hurry to take over a chair at Stanford, and Harry shows a basket of food, regretting that they don't have enough time, otherwise they would have arranged something grand. Edith notices a painting near the car. She is in awe, it looks very much like a Van Gogh, but she's never seen it before. John says it's a gift from a friend. Edith is surprised, it looks like an authentic one. John invites his friends into the house. They ask him to tell the truth, why is he leaving his home, and 10 years of teaching. John responds that he can't stay in one place for long, but his friends don't believe it. It can be that he moves so frequently. He is only 35 and he hasn't aged a bit in the last 10 years. Any woman on the faculty would give anything to know the secret. At that moment, Professor of Archaeology Art Jenkins arrives with his student, Linda. He gives John a book about prehistoric caves as a memento and also wonders where John is heading. Again, John says that he just enjoys moving around and brings out an expensive bottle of whiskey. People become more cheerful and forget about the uncomfortable questions. They form a circle and wish him a long life and good luck. On the shelf, Dan finds a strange bone artifact. It's a flint knife, a silicon tool for carving wood and bone. The Cro-Magnons used it in the Paleolithic era. While the group examines the artifact, John suddenly asks, what do they think an upper Paleolithic human would look like if they could have lived to the present time? Dan replies that, as Art's book says, he could be just like any of them, and if he had lived for centuries, he would have changed with each passing century. Meaning that the upper Paleolithic people had the same intelligence as modern humans, they just knew less. Linda is curious, according to the biologist, what would sustain his life? Biologist Harry says that it would require require complete cell regeneration. It is believed that the human body is designed for a lifespan of around 190 years. Edith laments, as many would love to know the secret of eternal life. Harry responds that what is magic for one time is science for another. After all, Columbus and Copernicus were once considered mad. And then John reveals that he could have traveled with Columbus, but he isn't the adventurous type. Moreover, he was already convinced that Earth was round. However, back then he still believed that there was a edge somewhere that one could fall off. The friends give uncertain smiles, thinking it's a joke, right? But John denies it. Every 10 years or so, people start to notice that he doesn't age and he has to leave. The friends are puzzled. Is he saying he's a Cro-Magnon? John explains that at least for the last 4,000 years since the time of Mesopotamia, he's been sure of it. In his first life, he lived to about 35 years old and became the leader of his tribe because they believed he was a sorcerer. He didn't even have to fight for it. But then fear arose and they banished him. People believed he was stealing their life force to remain young. He was pursued because he wouldn't die. That's how the habit of joining new tribes he encountered along the way emerged. At first, John thought something was wrong with him. Maybe he was evil and that's why he couldn't die. Then he thought he might be cursed, or on the contrary, blessed. Later, he believed there was some purpose to his existence. And now he thinks he simply came into being. His friends are intrigued. John's story is full of interest. Edith is curious again about the fate of the Van Gogh painting. And John tells them that Van Gogh gave him the painting when John was Jacques Bourne, a pig farmer. Van Gogh used to visit him, paint, and talk about how nature finds its reflection in art. Art asks, did you always leave? John shrugs. Sometimes he created a new identity for the next 10 years. Sometimes he even posed as his own son. But a few times he got caught. He even spent a year in a Belgian prison in 1862 for forging state documents. His friends start to get annoyed. John seems to have an answer to everything except one. Why does he do it? And he answers. He just wanted them to say goodbye to him specifically. 
After this, those around him conclude that John has serious issues. He remembers about moving, he still needs to take the boxes. While the man is carrying his belongings, Harry tries to find hidden microphones or cameras. People just can't believe that what is happening is real. At the car, Sandy confesses her love to John. He says that she's not indifferent to him either, but now she understands what she's getting into, right? Because one day he'll be forced to leave. He cannot give her eternity, but she objects. What is eternity, and who has it? Her parents divorced even before she was born. Besides, there's death, illness, insurmountable circumstances. Nobody knows how much time they have, whether it's a lot or little. She loves him and will accept everything he can give her. John and Sandy return to the house. Their friends say that they still have more questions. For example, does he remember any of his native languages? The man replies that he remembers a little. Besides, they haven't changed much. And did he engage in cave painting? Yes, he knew a man named Daru who was excellent at his work. He painted animals that hunters hope to kill and eat. Once, after an unsuccessful hunt, the leader knocked out all his teeth for failing with his magic. After that, someone had to chew his food for him. Eventually, he developed jawbone inflammation and they abandoned him. Then John headed east. It was at the beginning of the Bronze Age. He walked along trade routes and learned the languages of the places he visited. Everywhere there were myths about the creation of the world and new gods. He was a Sumerian for 2000 years, then a Babylonian during Hammurabi's reign. For some time he sailed as a Phoenician. It seems he spent his whole life on the road and learned a few new tricks. He even staged his own death a couple of times. He made it to India and met Buddha the most remarkable person he had ever encountered. Buddha taught John many things he had never pondered before. In the midst of the debate, Dr. Will Gruber arrives. The doctor says that there's absolutely no way for John to prove the truth of his story, and no way they could verify it. He is either their friend, or a caveman, or a liar, or a lunatic. The doctor is curious. In this extensive life being discussed, did he ever get sick? John answers affirmatively. Like everyone else, he had serious illnesses, perhaps pneumonia or other lung infections. He suffered from typhoid, yellow fever and smallpox. He survived the bubonic plague. And it's even more horrifying than history tells. But he doesn't have any scars. Among the friends, a debate flares up whether to believe John's stories or not. They contradict all their notions about nature. Dan is puzzled. A person with John's intellect would have studied a lot of things. John confesses he has 10 scientific degrees, including all those his friends have. He earned his biology doctorate at Oxford in 1840, but his achievements are just an excess of time, not brilliance. Suddenly, Dr. Will pulls out a gun. He asks John if he would survive if he's shot. But John never claimed he was immortal, just very old. The doctor is curious, what does John think about death, is he afraid of it? John explains that ancient people thought about death, but they had a practical understanding. They stopped moving, fell, and never got up. Infections were incomprehensible. Aging was the biggest mystery. So at first, John thought that everyone around him was wrong. After all, they aged and died. And again, the friends ask, what is it like for a person when everyone they knew has died? The doctor asks John about his parents, but he says he only remembers glimpses. The doctor remarks that it's not surprising, he too remembers his father very vaguely. Will starts reasoning about what's fair and what's not. They will all die and he will keep on living. If that's true, it's not surprising that they might feel envy and even hatred. He accuses John. The others are outraged and try to stop the doctor. But he says that John is living an unjust life. Perhaps it's time for him to die. The doctor leaves, and then Harry informs everyone that Will's wife died yesterday, which is why he's so aggressive. John runs after his friend to apologize. Meanwhile, the others discuss John. The theory of illness comes up. John returns. The next question from his friends is whether there are others like him. The man admits that in the 17th century he met someone like him. And that person told him everything, confirming that he was just like John but from a different time and place. They talked for two days and then parted ways. Edith asks if he believes in God. The friends become engaged as religious questions are close to everyone. Did he meet anyone from the Bible? Was he a part of religious history? Numerous theories are suggested. Edith is outraged considering it blasphemy. 
John recounts that he once encountered Buddha and he liked what he heard. He had been contemplating the teachings for 500 years. Then he became Etruscan and infiltrated the Roman Empire. He didn't like how it turned into a massive killing machine. He went to the Middle East, thinking of passing on Buddha's teachings in a renewed form. He tried but he was one dissident against Rome. Rome won and the rest is well known. So John was Jesus? Yes, during the crucifixion he blocked the pain. He learned this technique in Tibet. He also slowed down bodily processes so much that they couldn't be detected. Everyone thought he died. They took him down from the cross and laid him in a cave. When he regained consciousness he wanted to leave unnoticed, but a bunch of fanatics wouldn't let him do that. So he resurrected and headed to Central Europe. He can't prove it, he has no scars, and besides, they tied him down. But blood and nails look more convincing on icons. Edith is outraged, John deeply hurt her feelings. The friends start discussing religious questions. John says that he preached that Christ's teachings were about tolerance, brotherhood and love. Life is here on earth, here and now. But then the talking serpent persuaded the woman to eat the apple and everything went awry. Heaven and hell became tools for priests to rule with reward and punishment, trying to save souls that people never lost. John observes rituals, ceremonies, processions, genuflections, the moans of singers and choirs. And he thinks this is not what he meant. At this time, Dr. Will returns. The debates about religion, Christianity and piety continue. The friends rack their brains. Was it the fabrication, a mental disorder, drugs? But they can't find a solution. John completely baffled the four scientists. He continues to explain that religion is not what is happening now. The church grew out of fairy tales. Even the name Jesus grew out of John. He never claimed to be the son of God. He wanted to share knowledge. He did not walk on water or resurrect the dead. The friends gather to leave, although they are excited by his story. Edith pleads again to say that he's not Jesus, and she starts crying. The lights come on, Will demands that he admit that it was all a joke, and then John confesses that it was just a story. Their outrage knows no bounds, but John says that they themselves pushed him to this thought. They said he doesn't age, Edith saw Van Gogh, then found the chisel. They themselves bought into his game, and he couldn't resist seeing how they would react to his words. After all, he had such a splendid audience. An anthropologist, an archaeologist, an expert in Christianity, a psychologist, and a biologist. Linda, standing in the doorway, asks if the name Oldman is a play on words, Old Man. The infuriated people leave except for Will. He stays in the room and John sees his friends off. Sandy asks, what other telltale names did he come up with for himself? And John starts listing. John Politicalitical, John Hermit, and about 60 years ago when he was teaching at Harvard, he was John Thomas Party. Will's voice is heard. Wait, 60 years ago? John Party? John turns to him and says that his mother's name was Nola. Will initially denies every word, but in tears he confirms Nola was his mom. But he can't believe it, and he asks for the name of their dog. John names it, Woofy, and he asks if she got married again. Will says he feels cold, and John pities the old man, he was always cold. Will tries to touch his face, his father had a beard, and John confirms that he always checked if it was real. Will collapses, an ambulance and police car arrive at the house. They carry Will's body on a stretcher, covering it with a sheet over his head. Everyone leaves. Sandy asks if he has seen his adult child die before. John shakes his head. He gets into the car and drives away from the house. Sandy looks at him. The car stops at the bend. Smiling, she walks towards it. The Man from Earth is a very ambiguous movie. However, it makes you wonder. It raises very complex questions about morality, ethics, and religion. It is fascinating to follow the flight of human thought and to think, what if 